Yeah, start it. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm really excited uh, today that we are having Zhuho Kim as a speaker for the Michigan Interactive and Social Computing Series. Zhuho Kim is an associate professor in the School of Computing at KAIST, affiliate faculty in the Kim J. Chu Graduate School of AI at KAIST, and the director of Kix Lab, the KAIST Interaction Lab. His research in human computer interaction and human AI interaction focuses on building interactive and intelligent systems that support interaction at scale with the goal of improving the ways people learn, collaborate, discuss, make decisions, and take actions online. He earned his PhD from MIT in 2015, master's from Stanford in uh, 2010, and uh, BS from Seoul National University in 2008. In 2015 to 16, he was a visiting assistant professor and a Brown Fellow at Stanford University. He's a recipient of Kai's Songnam Distinguished Research Award, Grand Prize in Creative Teaching, uh, and Excellence in Teaching Award, as well as 14 paper awards from ACM Kai, CSW, Learning at Scale, IUI, DIS, and AAAI HCOMP. He's currently spending his sabbatical year at Ringo Inc., a startup building an online language tutoring platform to transfer his research on automatically analyzing and diagnosing learners' English proficiency into a real product. Personally, I've been a fan of and constantly inspired by Juho's work throughout my career, and we're really, really looking forward to his talk today. Uh, Juho, please take it away. Thank you so much for the fantastic introduction, Stu. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for having me remotely, and I will apologize once again for uh, not being there in person. I had originally intended to uh, travel um, in person, but then I have two small kids uh, at home and things are things got a little complicated, so I decided to uh, do it virtually. And I just realized that I, uh, I now that this is being recorded, I'll make it official that I, I stole your opportunities for uh, getting a uh, free food. So um, if you see me next time at conferences, I will uh, buy you a free lunch. <laughs> so uh, ping me that, that you attended the uh, MISC talk. Um, yeah, so as uh, she introduced, I'm uh, currently spending my sabbatical at a startup. Um, so it was a really, uh, you know, challenging and, and somewhat uh, un unusual uh, decision as a professor to make. Uh, but then I thought uh, I wanted to see how these interactive systems that I've been building over the years could make their ways into an actual product can, that you know thousands and millions of people can actually use. So I uh, decided to take that as an opportunity to really see you know, how that gets done. And, and I'm learning a lot. Um, and I'm also uh, spending time in California. So yeah, if anyone uh, you know, plans to visit, um, I'll be happy to you know, meet in person. The, um, today I'm going to talk about this idea of interaction-centric AI. And, and for those of you who have been you know, following, the, following the discourse in uh, AI, you'll probably see that uh, this is sort of a series of uh, you know, concept uh, that we have from, you know, more, more model-centric AI and also data-centric AI, which has been recently getting a lot of attention. Uh, so the idea of interaction-centric AI is not necessarily novel. I mean, as HCI researchers, I don't have to, uh, you know, convince this audience, especially that interaction matters uh, in designing AI applications and systems. Um, so instead of, you know, trying to convince you that AI-centric, uh, uh, interaction-centric AI matters, uh, I'm going to uh, do a deep dive of some of the systems that I've built uh, over the years and share very honest uh, reflection on what worked and what did not work uh, in these systems. And I think these lessons are important because due to the complex and technical nature of AI, like the black box and you know, uh, not being able to easily understand what's going on, um, AI systems are increasingly difficult to design. And we are yet to accumulate uh, knowledge of how to design well. Um, so I'm trying to provide some of these uh, data points uh, for other people to build up on and my uh, sort of ultimate proposal is that we need a more systematic, systematic ways of doing things. So uh, why don't we begin? So this is an operating room uh, with a surgical robot. 
So if you're used to seeing more conventional operating rooms, uh, it's very different from uh, the room uh, image they were seeing here. The reason is that this you know, big surgical robot that's about you know, $2 million a device uh, is sitting in the middle of the room. Um, and interestingly, the, the surgeons who are on the left, uh, they're not really uh, operating directly on the patient's body. Uh, it's almost as if they are you know, playing some kind of simulation or, or even like a game uh, through the controller. So all the control is happening you know, through this device and screen and the actual uh, you know, physical operation is done by these robotic arms. So why, why am I even talking about this uh, at the beginning of my talk? Uh, I want to touch upon not how the surgical robots are introduced and the te technology behind this, but rather what happens when these uh, machines are introduced and, and in terms of interaction, what has been happening. Uh, one of the interesting observations uh, when surgical robots uh, come into operating rooms is that uh, the residents, the residents are the trainees uh, in the operating rooms who are often assisting uh, the surgeons. So they are like, in, in a sense, graduate students, uh, assisting professors uh, in their research and so on uh, through uh, you know, apprenticeship over multiple years. And we know that that's, that's been sort of an effective way to train uh, skilled surgeons. Uh, but what happens is that with these robots uh, coming in, residents are not really needed in operating rooms anymore. And hospitals for you know, econ economical reasons don't really want many residents to come into the room and, and assist. And also, you know, in this kind of setting, there isn't much to actually watch and learn. Right, so uh, the over-the-shoulder learning that used to happen a lot uh, in these rooms um, is not really available anymore. So as a result, what is happening is that these residents are losing opportunities to learn. Um, so that's a very interesting, unexpected consequence of introducing surgical robots, is that they're losing opportunities to learn. And Matt Bean, uh, who has been doing extensive ethnographic studies of these operating rooms, uh, dubbed this as shadow learning. Um, and these residents are finding alternative ways to learn their uh, surgical skills and notably watching uh, YouTube videos and relying more on simulations and sometimes just prematurely jumping into practice. So one interesting takeaway uh, here is that maybe, you know, as manufacturers of surgical robots, they have not been thinking too much about the uh, residents. They're certainly not their primary customer group. Right. Uh, but then obviously there are these people who are sort of uh, left out uh, from the benefits of introducing surgical robots. And what if these uh, devices are built to be more collaborative and supportive of apprenticeship? So it'd be an you know, interesting idea for uh, brainstorming what uh, next uh, generation surgical robots could be. And here's another example. Um, so this is the company that I'm uh, currently working for. Uh, it's called Ringle. It's a language learning um, platform. So a good analogy might be it's like uh, Uber or Airbnb for language tutoring in that the uh, company tries to match an uh, English speaking tutor uh, with an English learner uh, through a Zoom-like uh, video chat session. And the session goes on for you know, 40 minutes or so, uh, where the, the you know, conversation-based session uh, takes place for language tutor. So the, as, a, as a platform, they uh, strive to uh, make this scale uh, in that they want to host you know, thousands and thousands of uh, these sessions online. Um, and the, the work that I'm currently doing involves um, understanding these uh, session in more depth. Specifically, what we're doing is to uh, you know, record the session, just like our session is being recorded right now. Uh, after the session is recorded, uh, we run automated speech recognition uh, to turn the session conversation into text. Um, and then we do uh, various types of diagnosis and analysis to provide feedback uh, to the learner in terms of their language proficiency, like uh, complexity, accuracy, and fluency. So that's the basic idea of what I'm doing uh, there. But again, why, why am I bringing this up? 
Uh, interestingly, uh, we ran into uh, this issue, uh, so to speak, uh, when we were trying to apply automated speech recognition AI. So for the di diagnostic uh, approach to work really well, we need uh, you know, high accuracy automated speech recognition. Um, but then interestingly, not interestingly, not even surprisingly, uh, the ASR technology is not perfect. So often these technologies are measured in terms of word error rate, which means, uh, you know, compared to the you know, correct uh, sentence, uh, what's the proportion of um, words that are erroneous. So can take can anyone take a guess as to what would be the word error rate of uh, the tutor and the student? Would they be the same or do you expect one group's performance to be significantly worse when running ASR? Maybe the learners are worse than the tutors. Yeah, yeah, um, and you're right in that, you know, uh, as a non-native speaker, I can also speak to myself that uh, when I speak to AI, uh, it doesn't work uh, as well uh, versus when my, you know, uh, English as a native speaking uh, person uh, does it. Okay, Anon says 15% tutor, 40% student. A little bit pessimistic about technology, I can see. Um, so here is the here's the average number that we uh, had uh, over you know, hundreds of sessions. So about 8% of error rate for tutors' uh, speech data, uh, whereas for students, it was uh, about 23%. Um, so the interesting point that I wanted to uh, you know, make here is that you know, the gap between 8 and 23, which is about 15%, is much larger than the 8%, the absolute error itself. Uh, and uh, the, the problem that I see is a lot of uh, what we do in AI, or, or as people who are developing technologies for AI, we are so focused on making this 8% lower, like making the best case better, but not necessarily narrowing the gap. Um, but again, we see that uh, you know, this gap is where you know, the most help is actually needed, and people who need the benefits of AI are actually disproportionately uh, not being supported well enough. And this gap actually broadens uh, if we look at the range, right? The best, uh, you know, tutor gets about 6% of error rate, whereas uh, some learners get as low as you know, 36%. Errors and again, this gap is really broad, and I, I you know, at, use this example to kind of you know, pose this question of: Are we really focusing on the right question uh, when we're developing AI technology? Are we, you know, spending maybe too, too much time and effort into making the six percent lower rather than thinking about the gap and what kind of um, user groups there are and what kind of gaps exist, what they mean, and how to uh, bridge those gaps. So we see a lot of uh, these cases in, in real life. I just started with uh, two illustrative examples of AI somewhat unexpected uh, consequences in terms of interaction. Um, then when we design these applications, it's uh, often, I feel, some kind of a matchmaking uh, between the, the user's needs um, and the AI technology. But then we don't really see that many successful AI applications yet. And of course, we need to look into some of the reasons why that's the case. And of course, in terms of technology, I feel a lot of the uh, AI technology focuses on, you know, beating the benchmark or beating the state of the art um, to, you know, make improvements in terms of accuracy and efficiency and things like that, which is great. But then it's not really enough uh, to make the entire AI application work in a real life context. It's more like a building block uh, that we need, but it's certainly not everything. And in terms of users, you know, based on what I've been seeing from different you know, companies and users, and especially from industry point of view right now, um, I see a lot of unfounded optimism. People believing that you know, applying AI will you know, solve their problem magically, which of course is not the case as we all know. And sometimes people have these unrealistic and uninformed expectations. Um, and sometimes there are even problems that are not really an AI problem to begin with, right? And of course, there is an interaction level issue as well. And 
in front of the uh, HCI audience, I don't really have to explain these concepts of gulf of execution and gulf of evaluation. And in terms of AI, I think uh, this gulf is actually deeper and wider uh, because it's actually harder to understand how the system works. It's harder to uh, for the system to be able to explain what the current state of the system actually is. And we'll know that in the middle, there is this mental model of how people see uh, the, the system that they're working uh, with um, works like. Um, and building an accurate mental model is actually very, very difficult uh, in AI systems for various reasons. And prior work has you know, pointed out how it's not about just applying the established usability guidelines as we know of, because uh, AI has this more uh, unique challenges that actually make it difficult for the existing guidelines to be readily applied. The, there's inconsistency and dynamic and things you know, evolve over time, things are unpredictable. So this brings up this question of, so then how do we actually design a successful AI applications? And I would argue that uh, we currently have more model-centric and data-centric uh, views of AI in designing most of the applications. And we need to think more about bringing in uh, interaction-centric AI uh, way of thinking in designing these applications. So what I mean by model-centric AI is, uh, you know, focusing more on getting good accuracy and, you know, thinking about uh, building well-trained models and beating the benchmark. And data-centric AI, which has been recently <clears throat> um, getting a lot of attention, uh, focuses a lot on building a streamlined infrastructure, <clears throat> excuse me, streamlined infrastructure for building AI applications, uh, thinking about the data aspects of it, and uh, making sure that even for small scale problems, um, the data pipeline is there, um, and so that the AI performance actually meets uh, the standard. Um, but then I think uh, the interaction-centric AI view um, sort of uh, brings our attention to the, the users and their interactions uh, with uh, AI in that we need to think more about the uh, user experience and building um, usable applications through uh, human AI interaction so that uh, complex real-world tasks could actually be supported well by these uh, AI-centric uh, interaction-centric AI point of view. Um, so here's my definition of the concept. I think it's an approach to systematically designing and engineering human AI interaction that overcomes the limitations of the model and data-centric views. And again, as I said in the beginning, I don't think it's a new idea or you know, something that no one is actually doing, right? It's, it's basically as HCI researchers doing human AI interaction work, uh, this is what our community has been doing all along, uh, and I'm just trying to, uh, you know, parallelize uh, this against uh, model and um, data centric view. And also, it's not my goal is not to say that you know model and data centric views are bad or not needed. Uh, all I'm arguing for is that we need a complementary perspective, and we need more attention to interaction-centric AI, and even start with interaction-centric AI view, rather than start with the model and data and then think about interaction, which I think uh, is the case in most uh, real-life scenarios, unfortunately. Um, so as HCI researchers, we are all, you know, if you are working in the human AI interaction space, I think you are all making some kind of contributions to interaction-centric AI. And there are all these different, you know, types of contributions that we can make, and all of them are definitely needed. Um, and for today's talk, I want to focus on the interactive systems component. That's the part that uh, I've been uh, you know, focusing on mostly in my work. Um, so I want to draw attention to interaction systems component, but the, these other uh, aspects I think are really important as well. Okay, and I'm going to do that uh, through uh, three case studies of actual systems that I've uh, built over the years. Okay, uh, first of all, 
I want to start with online education. So the way I'm going to talk about these systems is rather than going into sort of the technical details of the, how the system was implemented, I want to touch up on the main idea of how the system works and what interaction takes place and, and reflect and sort of talk about what lessons about interaction that, that we've learned uh, through a user study or a deployment of the system. And there are lots of uh, how-to videos online, and we learn how to cook, how to apply filters in Photoshop, and um, assemble furniture, or learn about math uh, through these how-to videos. Um, but it's often very difficult to you know, find and repeat and skip a certain information because all this information is sort of hidden inside the video. Uh, so we thought, uh, wouldn't it be nice to uh, have a table of contents uh, like information in the sidebar? of the video. And uh, in AI, people are uh, formulating this as a, you know, automated summarization problem. We thought, but we thought maybe we don't have to entirely rely on AI or, you know, AI doesn't have to, AI is not that perfect in this kind of scenarios. And we can actually do a better job uh, with the hybrid of um, human learners and AI. So we built this system. Um, so it's a it's a you know video learning platform just like YouTube. And the way it works is that we're seeing a fast forwarded version of it. Uh, as the learner watches a video, the video pauses once in a while and asks the learner to either summarize what they uh, were just learning in one sentence, or you know vote for what they think is the best description of what they watched. Um, so this is a so a learner sourcing application where learners are contributing this data. And what happens is that uh, the system is using this information to generate a video outline. So learners are prompted to summarize um, and the system coordinates these tasks and collects all this information and use some you know, simple uh, AI to uh, process it. And then the system can then present an updated video outline, which can then benefit uh, future learners. So what's happening under the hood is there's this multi-stage learner sourcing workflow in that you know, different groups of learners are getting different tasks as they're watching the video so that uh, we want to make sure that people are, um, you know, doing the tasks that actually make sense for them. At the same time, the data being collected uh, by the system is helping the system achieve its goal of creating a better outline. So it's a dual purpose system like uh, you know, reCAPTCHA or uh, image labeling. Um, uh, so that we want to make sure that in a single system, both the user and the system can uh, achieve their individual goals. So we built uh, the system and tried to evaluate it by looking at both uh, the learner's benefit, learners who are contributing these summary labels, as well as the resulting artifact, which is the uh, you know, final summary labels that are collectively uh, contributed by the learners. So we ran this uh, study to understand the pedagogical benefits of uh, learner sourcing uh, on MTurk, where we uh, recruited uh, 300 Turkers on Mechanical Turk, a crowdsourcing platform. Uh, we asked them to watch uh, intro statistics uh, videos. And then we compared uh, three video interfaces in between subject setting, where we uh, measured learning. And what were the three uh, interface conditions? Uh, we first had the baseline, which did not have any in-video prompting and no uh, sidebar information was shown to the learners. And then we also had the uh, sort of the best case scenario where we uh, showed the expert uh, generated summary by the sideline, but we did not have the prompting. And in the <clears throat> in the crowdy condition, crowdy is the name of our system. Uh, it had the in-video prompting. Learners are uh, contributing uh, their sub goals, the the summary labels, uh, and then the sub goals are shown. Uh, the main result of the study was that people were actually learning better than the baseline when using our system. So we did a retention test. Uh, we asked people to come back after a few days of watching the video and uh, measured how well they remember. Um, and 
in the crowded condition, uh, similar to the expert condition, uh, people were remembering uh, more sub goals uh, than the baseline learners. So we have some evidence that uh, using crowdy can uh, help people actually learn. Um, and what about the data aspect? Now that you know people are doing this not because they are trying to help the system or they are forced to uh, help the system, but rather it can give them individual benefits. But uh, at the same time, are they doing high quality work for the system? So. To evaluate this, we uh, deployed the system live um, where we had about 50 web programming and statistics videos uh, in both a classroom and we sort of opened our website for everyone in the world to kind of you know, come in and do whatever they want. Um, and over the course of a few months, we had about a thousand active participating uh, users and hundreds of these you know, activities that were recorded by the system. And more of an anecdotal uh, evidence is that uh, when we analyzed uh, four most popular videos that had most amounts of uh, learner contributions, uh, we were seeing that uh, the majority of uh, learner generated sub goals were rated as matching or even better uh, than the goals that were generated by experts. So we invited third party raters to make this comparison. So uh, we can see that learners are uh, doing a good job uh, in doing the summarization and the system is able to you know, coordinate that to generate a high quality sub goal, a summary. Um, so in summary, uh, the human in this system is answering uh, the summarization questions and they just naturally learn from the video. And the system does its job of collecting this filtering and coordinating learner tasks. And the interaction that happens in the middle is that this video summary can help people uh, better uh, learn from the video because of the uh, sidebar uh, information that they are given. So this is the, the you know, basic idea of the system. And uh, some of the lessons that uh, we learned uh, from building and evaluating the system is this idea of a co-learning system where the uh, user and the system can learn at the same time. And I think uh, as the system more actively uses AI, uh, this co-learning aspect will be more important in that uh, it's incentivizing both parties. Uh, you know, users would have their uh, individual uh, incentive to you know, participate and contribute to the system. And at the same time, the system can use that data or AI can use that data to uh, you know, further improve its performance. And I think bridging this uh, loop uh, in this kind of a co-learning system where it's happening interactively, uh, I think has a lot of uh, interesting potential. And because you know, this system inherently is a socio-technical system. Um, it's important to incentivize user to participate. And one lesson we had was that making user contributions more visible and rewarding is key. And this is also happening in a more sort of a coordinated manner with somewhat inherent uh, collaboration in that people don't really directly collaborate with other people, but others collaboration, uh, others uh, contributions can be uh, visible and, and made more uh, explicit so that there's more sense of uh, community in doing this, which I think is uh, really valuable. So this was the basic idea behind uh, learner sourcing, which is uh, the title of my PhD thesis uh, back in 2015. And since then, we've uh, developed a few more uh, applications in other domains, uh, like, so this was learner sourcing and in-video summary. Uh, we also had systems for uh, learner sourcing explanations to a, a problem. Uh, we also had systems for uh, building a concept map, uh, like a visual uh, version of a summary. We all recently also had uh, in programming assignments, uh, building this uh, problem representation, which was also uh, learner sourced. So I think uh, this idea uh, has some generalizable insights uh, that could be applied to a broad set of applications. Um, and I believe this co-learning uh, aspect by incentivizing people who are entering the system um, 
can be more, uh, you know, uh, actively investigated in future work. Okay, uh, and now I want to move on to the second case. Um, now I want to talk about a completely different uh, domain, although it's still somewhat learning related, in that in this system called Solution Chat, um, published at CHI 2020, uh, led by Song Chal Lee, uh, one of my PhD students, um, we wanted to uh, help people in a chat-based discussion, especially in terms of moderation. Um, these days, a lot of people are working on content moderation in online communities and, and social media. Uh, but in this setting, we particularly focus on uh, sort of the real-time moderation and moderation of uh, the discussion itself, and not necessarily you know, filtering out harmful content, but more about uh, you know, facilitating participation and tracking everyone's uh, uh, progress and things like that. So what motivated us to uh, work on this problem uh, was that in many of the remote settings, uh, structured discussion can often lead to collective action. So I guess you all have an experience uh, in your you know, Slack group discussing some important matters to uh, you know, turn into a set of actual to-do items and collective action. But doing this well is really hard, especially if uh, the problem that you're tackling is ill-structured without a clear you know, optimal uh, solution. And uh, as a participant, I, I just have this you know, TV uh, debate uh, as an illustrative uh, example, but you can imagine being a participant of this discussion. And there are many things you have to do. You have to speak, listen, and ask questions and defend yourself while keeping track of the overall discussion dynamics. On the moderator side, it's even more challenging. And there's a lot of you know, cognitive overhead in managing a discussion because uh, as a moderator, you have to draw people's attention and summarize what's happening and encourage uh, people to reach a consensus and stimulate ideation and reasoning. So it's a lot of work. So we thought, uh, why don't we try to uh, use AI to help a little bit uh, by assisting uh, human moderators? So this is a system that we built uh, called Solution Chat. Uh, so it's a chat-based um, interface uh, that's got this sidebar on the left. And on the right, we have these blue blocks uh, that I think are really uh, key for uh, the system. And I'm just realizing that I'm a fan of adding a sidebar to whatever uh, interface that I built. I, I just realized that. Um, anyway, um, so what you see on the left is an agenda panel, uh, which uh, serves as a uh, sort of summary of uh, the discussion, like the, the agenda and the main ideas for each of the uh, discussion items. Uh, this is manually moderated. This is not an AI part. Um, so. As a moderator, you can sort of uh, add in your default agenda, and people can easily, you know, add and remove and vote uh, for different uh, concrete ideas within each of the uh, items. The part that uses AI is this part on the right uh, with the blue message blocks. Um, so a good analogy is Gmail's uh, smart reply. Right. When you get an email, uh, Gmail recommends uh, appropriate responses that you can easily uh, you know, click and adapt. Um, so similar to that, we have that in the real-time chat context. Um, and we look through a lot of literature on discussion-based learning um, in classrooms and so on um, to sort of tease apart uh, good practices for moderation. Um, Coupling with uh, AI that tries to understand the intent of what people are trying to say, um, the system in real time makes recommendations um, of these moderation messages. So an example moderation message would be uh, when the system um, thinks that you know, more ideas need to be uh, contributed, it has a recommended message of any more ideas. Or should we vote now if the system believes uh, enough discussion has been held by the group? And the human moderator can easily uh, pick a message by just selecting uh, 
one of the recommended messages. And this is to uh, sort of uh, reduce the potential cost of incorrect recommendations. We wanted to give people more control in what message they you know, select and not. So with this system, uh, we ran a controlled study um, by inviting uh, 12 groups of people. Um, and then we assigned one moderator per each group and we assigned them three conditions. So in the baseline, they had just the chat box. Um, and in the second condition, they had the baseline plus the agenda panel on the left. And the third condition, it, it's got the full solution chat system. Um, one of the interesting findings was that people were selecting uh, recommended messages quite significantly. Um, so as you can see from this graph, uh, about 10.5 uh, accepted messages, uh, the, the moderators accepted uh, about 10.5 uh, messages per their short discussion session. Um, and interestingly, the when we look at, when we counted uh, the number of moderation messages, not the actual discussion, but you know messages that were about moderating the discussion itself, uh, when people were having the agenda panel or the message recommendation, um, the user generated manually typed uh, moderation messages actually decreased uh, from the baseline. And I think this is the effect of having the agenda panel, which kind of serves as a summarization um, so that it doesn't really call for explicit uh, summarization by the moderator. But then when they were having the real-time uh, message recommendations, uh, we see this blue block here, uh, there's a huge spike in the number of moderation messages. And uh, our interpretation is that because it's so easy to add in a moderation message, uh, many moderators just choose to, chose to uh, use a message just to make sure, even if it's uh, not that effective or you know, people might already have a similar idea, but many moderators kind of you know did it anyway because it's kind of cheap to do so. And we also analyzed the number of managerial prompts. So these are the prompts that were used to kind of manage the discussion. And we were also seeing that uh, with the message recommendation, we're seeing a significantly more of these uh, managerial support messages. So in this system, as you can see, the human manages the chat discussion. It's the human moderator who still has control. And we didn't try to replace the human moderator with the AI moderator. Um, and AI is trying to understand intent. And based on the literature on discussion-based um, education, it's recommending these messages, moderation messages, in real time. And the interaction that happens is that um, efficient uh, facilitation was achieved while the human user uh, still has control. So that's the system. And again, I want to uh, talk about the human AI interaction aspect of it. Um, so we had this opportunity to actually deploy the system to a real audience. Um, so due to uh, the pandemic, many of the corporate education that was uh, previously done in an in-person setting moved to remote. Uh, and this you know, uh, corporate partner that we worked with uh, reached out to us uh, asking for uh, our you know, discussion-based solution in an educational setting. Um, so we had about you know, more than 2,000 users in over 400, 500 uh, groups um, to um, have this online discussion using solution chat as a support. And some interesting findings were that uh, people had this uh, collaborative mental model building phase uh, in, in most groups. So and it's kind of obvious, right? I mean, you are you get to use this new system that uh, does AI uh, recommendations with moderation messages. So people, not surprisingly, uh, played around it in a group to kind of get a sense of how it works. And they were sharing what they learned and and they were asking other people to type in this message so that they can kind of compare what they get. And that it was all happening through chat. And another uh, sort of the uh, unexpected consequence kind of um, uh, category observation uh, was that people were experiencing this social burden in working with me message recommendations. 
If you remember, I previously mentioned that people had a lower burden in clicking the, the messages. So we were seeing a spike in the count of messages that were selected. Uh, but the slightly overlooked aspect was that there could have been a social burden uh, in using uh, AI generated messages. So what do I mean by that? So I do uh, have some uh, example scenarios here. So they were initially uh, discussing in Korean and then I translated to English. So some of them might not be perfectly natural sounding, but um, hopefully it still uh, gives you the idea. So in the first case right here, um, so this is the uh, AI recommended message. So I wonder what this user thinks. Can you tell us your opinion? So this was the uh, message that was recommended by AI, probably because it was thinking this user was not participating uh, as actively. Um, but then the moderator says, oh, AI seems to like this user and keep wondering about the opinions of this particular user. And other people are also saying, uh, oh, he is favored by AI and AI seems to be biased. Um, so people are, kind of, you know, questioning why, you know, AI uh, is picking on this person. And on the right, uh, the moderator says, oh, no, no, not the moderator. Uh, one of the users says, oh, let's discuss the positive and negative aspects of introducing AI in any order. But then AI picks on the, the wrong kind of information uh, and says, why is there no order? So it's uh, really like asking an unnecessary question and being picky. Um, and people are saying, oh, it's too aggressive. It sure is. I'm afraid of replying to that. And, and it feels like nitpicking. Uh, and this final one here, you can see that there are many uh, recommended messages. Um, so the, one of the users said, I'm doubtful about the credibility of AI. And uh, the moderator uh, clicks uh, thanks for your opinion. And another user says, I also think negatively. And thanks for your opinion. Thanks for sharing a good opinion. <laughs> Shall we go to the next topic? And the moderator realized that uh, it was a little bit of an un unnatural sequence of uh, messages that uh, he would not otherwise do uh, by himself. So he apologized by saying, sorry for my unnatural words as I'm using AI recommendations. So here, uh, as we interviewed this uh, moderator, he was saying that he wanted to acknowledge people's contributions and the recommendations seemed appropriate, but then the tone of it and, and how it was actually delivered wasn't perfectly matching his intentions. So that's why he added this apologetic uh, message at the end, which we thought was an interesting kind of social burden that people had to bear in using AI recommendations. Okay, um, now I want to move on to my final example of styling the web. So it was a, a recent paper at CHI 22, um, led by Tesu Kim, uh, a PhD student of mine, uh, about um, styling the web with natural language. So here, what we wanted to enable was that um, in the four people who do not have enough knowledge in web programming or web design, it's really hard to make changes to uh, websites' designs. You might want to do that when, you know, there are these web pages that just make your eyes bleed because of the poor color choice, or maybe some, you know, buttons are not that visible or some items are not, not that clickable. Swim it. So you might want to make these uh, small and big changes, uh, even as an end user. But it's often very difficult for you to do it if you don't have enough HTML, CSS knowledge. So we thought, what if the user could simply speak their intent in natural language and the system can kind of you know, recommend uh, changes that are about um, this um, intent that the user has. So for example, if the user said, tone down this text, uh, the system uh, tries to uh, show, oh, are these the design changes you want to try out? And uh, the user can explore some of them and decide uh, which ones to take. So here's a demo of the system. Hopefully the audio is audible. Make this larger. Yeah, so what happened here was that the user said, make this larger after clicking on this uh, Keist website's uh, top uh, title bar that says Keist. 
Um, and after a few seconds, the system presents uh, the user with this kind of panel, uh, which is about making something larger. But uh, as you can see, it's not just about increasing the font size, uh, but making something larger can mean you know, increasing the overall height or fixing the, the padding or width, which could have the uh, enlarging effect. So what the system is trying to do is to show these uh, related uh, design attributes the user can uh, explore and choose. And again, it's not about you know, directly making the change uh, by AI, but it does give you uh, give the user an ability to kind of explore and make decisions on their own. And confirm and got larger. Emphasize this part. The user says emphasize this part. And again, um, the system pr presents uh, a set of design attributes uh, that could be related to emphasis by changing the font family, font size, font style, weight. And you can note that uh, the, the order and the items that are presented are different uh, depending on the user uh, query. So to implement this system, we had this natural language processing and computer vision uh, pipelines. And in a, in a nutshell, we um, you know, used a large language model to kind of understand the user intent and make connections to the related uh, style attributes. And in terms of computer vision, we collected uh, millions of uh, design snippets uh, from all over the web. Um, to suggest appropriate values uh, for the changes. So again, uh, if you're interested about the technical details, please refer to the paper. Um, so with the system, we thought, oh, this is really cool. Now people can change the website design with natural language. Uh, so let's do some evaluation. Um, so what we did was uh, to run this uh, lab study uh, by putting people into two conditions. Uh, in one, Stylet is the name of the system. So we had uh, half a group of uh, people, one group uh, doing the Stylet, um, and the other group using uh, Chrome web browsers developer, developer tools, which is sort of the standard uh, way to make uh, web changes. Um, and we gave people two tasks. Uh, the first one was a well-defined task uh, where they were presented with the before image and their goal is to uh, uh, make it as close to uh, the after image as possible. Uh, whereas in the second task, we gave people an open-ended task. Uh, we gave people this uh, blank slate and they were able to make any kind of creative changes that they want. So the, the most exciting uh, result perhaps was that people were able to uh, complete the task successfully in a much shorter time. So in the stylet condition, 80% of people were able to complete the task as opposed to 35%. Note that these were people with zero uh, exposure and knowledge of uh, web programming uh, beforehand. Um, and, and then the test completion time was also much shorter uh, with 35% less time, which is great. Um, and we also looked at what kind of changes and how many changes, uh, design changes people are exploring and making. Um, in terms of the actual number of changes made, uh, in both cases, we were seeing a similar number. But interestingly, with Stylet, people were exploring more diverse properties. And we think this was due to the conscious design decision of presenting multiple uh, design recommendations rather than just showing uh, a, a very narrow set of items so that people were playing around with different ones. Okay, so far so good. Uh, and we also thought, oh, maybe because people are, you know, going to be able to do things uh, better with a more, a more, um, you know, efficiency, probably their self confidence uh, will be uh, increased as well. But this was not what happened. So initially, um, in both conditions, people's self confidence on their design skills has increased. This is somewhat expected, right? People were able to accomplish something, so they have more confidence. But then after doing the second task, the, the open-ended task, people's self-confidence went down in the style condition, whereas in the uh, development uh, developer tools condition, it kept increasing. So we thought this was very unexpected. Um, and people were saying, 
that uh, with the developer tools, they were just excited that they were able to accomplish something. Uh, you know, this is my first time handling CS CSS, but I did this. But with Stylet, people were asking for more control <clears throat> and more surprises in, in AI, that I expected more surprising changes like clearing. <clears throat> so I think what was happening here is that as users' level of knowledge <clears throat> has increased, excuse me, let me drink some more. Yeah, so, um, excuse me. Um, yeah, as users' knowledge of um, web design has increased, they were expecting more control and they were expecting more things to happen, but then they were still left with natural language, uh, which was good for initially trying out different things, but it wouldn't really give them the fine control that they needed. Um, so one lesson here is that we perhaps need a more adaptive approach, right? As the user's uh, knowledge uh, accumulates over time, maybe we should gradually remove the support um, um, from automation and probably give people more direct manipulation opportunities. Um, so I think maybe a version two, uh, 2.0 of this system could uh, be more adaptive uh, in this aspect. So um, to wrap up the talk, <clears throat> I presented you with uh, three cases of AI-infused interactive systems. And you might be wondering, wh why even bother to build all these complex interactions? Maybe it would be better to just automate things, like automated video summarization, automated moderation, automated you know, optimal design uh, uh, generation. But then, I mean, for some of the projects, this was actually what we initially intended to explore. But this was our thought process. Initially, we started by asking, you know, can we fully automate this? Like, can we have an you know AI that moderates a discussion? But then we thought, but why do we even need to do it? I mean, technologically speaking, it would be an interesting thing to explore, but then why do we even need to do this uh, for users? Are there actual reasons um, that we should not be fully automating things? And for each of the applications, there were clear reasons where people didn't really want such automation. Then the follow-up question is, then how not to fully automate it? How much AI is okay in this context? And where should AI be put in? And what exactly should it do and not do? And after all that is said, then the question is how to better support uh, human AI collaboration. So with this kind of thought process, um, this is my last uh, slide. Some of the lessons. First of all, uh, we learned that full automation is often not the answer in that uh, it might look more fancy and, and more sort of um, you know, exciting as a demo, um, but in most uh, real life cases, uh, full AI isn't really uh, the answer. And also another realization is that full AI and full manual isn't a binary condition, right? There's all these uh, things in the middle that we can explore. And picking the right midpoint, I think is often the key uh, in designing applications that actually uh, work uh, with people. And this is Ben Schneiderman's uh, you know, two-dimension um, human-centered AI diagram. And I, I like this because it tells us that achieving a high level of human control and high level of automation at the same time is possible with good design. And this is really giving us hope as an HDI researcher in that we can achieve this uh, while uh, enjoying the benefits of uh, what AI can give us. We can still give people enough control and agency. And not surprisingly, the user experience of AI should be considered uh, because humans are not uh, the static sort of receiver of uh, AI results. And this is a critical mistake that a lot of um, AI system designers make in that we have to consider that humans also change and, and evaluate the systems in their ways. And they try to adapt to the system. They use, misuse, abuse the system and learn at the same time. So humans as a more dynamic uh, um, entity is something that should be considered uh, more seriously. 
And finally, more from the system building perspective, uh, I think we need more HCI level contributions in terms of uh, uh, more robust and reusable building blocks uh, for building these applications. In that, uh, in AI, we're seeing more and more of these general purpose models or models that can work across different tasks, like large uh, pre-trained models and so on. Um, and in interfaces, I have to confess that in most of my work, I've been uh, focusing on, you know, building an optimized or customized application that works in that particular context. Um, but then zooming out, we can think about what are the you know, core design insights or core design uh, components, uh, UI framework, UI design patterns, UI widgets that could be applied to a broad set of uh, AI applications. And I think we are yet to explore this uh, space um, as a community. Uh, I mean, there has been exciting work in this space, but we need more and more uh, work in this area. Okay, so uh, that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the great talk, Juha. I learned a lot. Um, so let's see. Uh, whether, uh, so for everyone, if you have questions, feel free to send them in the chat or raise your hand. I see that Robin has her hand up. Uh, Robin, please go ahead. Yes, thank you. And thank you for your talk to her. Um, okay. Throughout the talk, I was, I, was at, I was thinking about questions related to your previous slide around some of these big challenges. And I see one as being explainability that often comes up in interaction-centric AI, UX AI type of research. So what do you see as the biggest challenge into making some of these systems and models more um, transparent and explaining um, what is what's happening? Sorry, I, I yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think I got the question. So the question was about it was what's the biggest challenge around explainability? Oh, 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 the biggest challenge around explainability. Yeah, um, I, I uh, as uh, many of the researchers in this space would argue, um, making models more explainable is one you know big technical challenge that many people are faced with. Uh, on the other aspect, uh, more HCI people are focused on making explanations that actually are understandable. And I feel breaching the two has not been all that successful, right? If you talk to AI people, uh, they care about uh, turning model results into an explanation. But then whether that explanation actually worked for the target audience uh, is often out of scope uh, for, for machine learning researchers. Uh, and for, from the uh, HCI perspective, many people are thinking about uh, whether this explanation um, you know, is comprehensible enough or you know, it had what kind of effect on the human user. But then in including myself, uh, we often lack more detailed understanding of how these models exactly work. Um, so that I feel like two communities are still somewhat distant uh, from each other. Um, so I think one, um, you know, a grand challenge in terms of explainability is that uh, by bridging the efforts between the two communities in that, you know, technically applicable solutions that actually uh, provide value to the users uh, is, I think, one uh, promising direction in terms of explainability. And uh, Juha, I have a question about the last work, uh, Starting the Web, you talked about. I think it's really interesting that you found uh, uh, people's uh, confidence de decreased in the open-ended task when using Starlet. Uh, so, and I think the explanation you offered was that they may feel, feel the Starlet condition was restricted. I'm wondering whether the reason could be the opposite, like whether it's, it could be because in the open-ended task, because they were not sure what the goals were, and then they were not comfortable coming up with these natural language prompts to actually uh, query the AI. So I wonder whether the solution could be like to provide them with better natural language prompts so that they can interact with the AI better, or whether we should like uh, fade the AI support instead of having them use the developer tools. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. I mean, it's something that I have not thought about deeply enough, and that's a very plausible interpretation as well. 
So uh, if I understood correctly, maybe the, the reason people's self-confidence dropped is because they were having difficulty formulating a more advanced uh, natural language uh, queries. Mm -hmm. um, right. And, and I think in, you know, your interpretation and you know, our interpretation, in both cases, I think it's uh, true that people's as people's experience and, and expertise uh, grows, uh, they might want more fine-grained uh, control in, mm -hmm. in what they want to expect. And, and I think, yeah, I think it's a fantastic idea to provide further support on the natural language side of things so that um, people can uh, try to formulate more detailed, more nuanced, and more advanced uh, queries through natural language that the system can handle. And our interpretation was to maybe uh, do not rely on natural language so much, but rather invite people to you know directly work with the the mm -hmm. design attributes more directly, so that uh, they can um, uh, uh, have more finer grained control in the final outcome. And yeah, maybe I mean these two are perhaps not uh, conflicting mm -hmm. with each other in that yeah, uh, more support in the natural language side uh, can be done while giving people more control. Uh, the, the reason we uh, I mentioned more on the, the direct manipulation side was because we also thought it as an educational application mm -hmm. where what if let's say in a in a you know intro to uh, web design kind of class uh, students are presented with this kind of tool in the very early stage of their learning and you know get used to uh, seeing what kind of things are possible um, and eventually uh, treating this tool as almost a scaffold we can eventually uh, reduce it uh, reduce the reliance of it um, so that people can um, you know get used to directly working with uh, these attributes and yeah it's a fantastic point Thanks, Juho. Um, I do have a couple more questions, but I want to see whether the students have any questions. Oh, Gregory, uh, please go ahead. Hi. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in kind of along the same lines, talking about how experts prefer kind of that more direct control um, rather than the natural language. Some of the like, really exciting AIs that have been released lately, like GPT-3 and Dolly, like they rely on prompts. And to, it's kind of frustrating to a lot of programmers how imprecise natural language is. Do you think that's kind of a, a sustainable interface or will those models have to adapt to a more uh, precise interface? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. And and a lot of people have been spending more time these days uh, working with prompts and prompt engineering um, than we thought. Um, and many of these models use prompts as an interface, right? So very similar to what we did in Stylet, uh, you know, if you use yeah, GPT-3 or, uh, you know, stable diffusion models, um, it's almost as if these, uh, you know, natural language prompts are a gateway to sort of unleashing uh, all these uh, capabilities of AI. And people have been experimenting with different prompts to kind of see what kind of changes they make and not. So uh, a related lesson uh, is that, you know, prompts are good in terms of, you know, uh, getting people used to uh, interacting with AI, especially in the early stages. But uh, applying the, the lessons from this work to um, broader uh, settings with generative models, I think we uh, need better interfaces, really, in that um, in terms of fancy demos, they are perfectly fine. I mean, you know, you try different uh, prompts, uh, see how it is, and it has this wow factor. But then I've seen many, many cases where people are, you know, trying to use these results in a more serious setting. Uh, it's not really there yet, right? So often things stop at the exploratory stage, um, but we need a finer grained control. And also, I think uh, one interesting HCI level challenge is what kind of interaction layer of support we can add to these generative models. Um, so in uh, one of the unpublished work that is cu currently under submission, uh, we try to add an interaction layer for more experimentation and iteration 
in that uh, it's really hard for people to keep track of different attempts they have made with their prompts and the settings that they have changed. Uh, what if we provide people with a more systematic way of, you know, tracking the changes that they've made, comparing these different versions so that they can make a more informed decision? And I think this uh, something along these lines, I think, is a fascinating sort of HCI level challenge that can significantly improve the usability of uh, these AI models. Um, great, Zhuho, we have a question by Lei in the chat. Right. Uh, related to that question, I'm wondering if there is any social factor affecting here. People might feel rewarded when they mastered HTML and CSS that is more mainstream and recognized by other people. Yeah, that's a great uh, observation. And I think it also has to do with uh, the what is the ultimate skill that they want to learn, right? Um, with the stylet example, no one would want to be the master in the natural language query form formation here, uh, but they would, would want to eventually learn how to do HTML and CSS. Uh, that would be the ultimate learning goal uh, in this case. Uh, yeah, but maybe with things like GPT-3 and stable diffusion, it might be slightly different in that uh, not many users would want to you know, master the technical details of uh, you know, how GPT-3 works, but rather they want to just use it for their uh, you know, actual context. So I can see that uh, there could be a slight difference, but it's a yeah, great point that um, people's ultimate goal uh, might be different. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, thank you so much, Juho. We are at one, and I know that a lot of our students are meeting with you this afternoon, uh, so we can save more questions until your one-on-one -on -one meetings. Uh, let's give another round of applause to Juho for the great talk. Um, thank you. Yep. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for coming and asking great questions. Thank you. Thanks,